Good afternoon and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Um, today is Tuesday, May 11th, and our afternoon committee meeting um, will be sort of focused on us understanding um, who are the unemployed um, in Vermont um, as we try to figure out what people need um, and things like that. And we have a uh, to help us with that, uh, Joyce Manchester from uh, Joint Fiscal. Welcome, Joyce. Thank you very much. It's good to see all of you. For the record, I'm Joyce Manchester with the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, the question is, who are the unemployed? And the uh, federal government publishes a data set which is titled Characteristics of Unemployment Insurance Recipients. So in the past, we have relied on that report, that data set, to tell us about the uh, characteristics of who's on unemployment insurance. However, um, you may recall that I was the one who was circulating the idea that 73% of unemployment insurance recipients in Vermont were women as of November of 2020. And, uh, I was not aware that there were any problems with the underlying data for that report. However, in the last month or so, there have been some comments from the Department of Labor suggesting that maybe that data is not as strong as we would like, and maybe we shouldn't be repeating 73% uh, many, many times because it might not be accurate. So my job today is to first reinforce the idea that yes, women are bearing a bigger burden of, of unemployment during the recession. And we will see some very good data, very strong data that will substantiate that. And also I'm going to explain why it is that the characteristics of unemployed um, are no longer so good to look at. So there's probably still giving us the right idea, but the exact number is probably not right. Okay, so if you like, I can share my screen uh, to show you the issue brief and to run through that. Uh, if you all look at it yourselves, I can just talk it through. Which do you prefer? It seems to depend upon the day. Let me, um, <laughs> what do folks want? Can they look at it on their computer or do you wanna see it up on the screen? I have it on my computer. I don't know what others need. I'm seeing most people. Um, Carl, can you pull it up? I'm sure I can. I just have to do it. Okay, I'm just- Okay. Process. And Topper? And James, I'm assuming you can. Um, why don't we, why, um, I don't think we need it. Um, thank you, um, Joyce. We all, um, many of us are using two devices. So Great. we'll pull it up and some will just pull it up on their computer. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm going to start with the issue brief. And um, if questions arise or if we have time, we can certainly go to the, uh, the slides that are also posted on, on your website. So let's start with the issue brief. This was just released yesterday and I spent a good amount of quality time looking into the, the data last week. Um, so as the summary states, in the world of the pandemic, the data underlying the statistic on women's share of unemployment insurance recipients in Vermont no longer rep represents the full population of UI recipients. So that's why we have concerns about the accuracy of the gender share in the data. However, I'm going to be talking later about other very good data, very reliable data on jobs and earnings in Vermont that will show that working women have been disproportionately hurt by the pandemic. And this issue brief is focused on uh, the, the gender split among the unemployed who are getting unemployment insurance, but um, Later on, we can also look at the industry split, the sector split, where are the unemployed coming from? 
Okay, so I've already mentioned the 73% of recipients in November 2020 we thought were women. However, uh, what people often forget is that those statistics do change over time. And as of March 2021, the most recent month for which we have data, that proportion was 60%. So already, um, according to the, the data, the share of women among the unemployed has come down. But what really caused some questions was the fact that uh, the proportions for Vermont were much higher than any other state in the country and much, much higher than the national average. So uh, there were lots of questions about why is Vermont so different? Um, and we were scratching our heads and trying to come up with reasonable answers, but in fact, maybe we didn't have to come up with those answers. Okay, so it turns out that prior to the pandemic, the data that, that were behind the report from the Department of Labor were about 95% of all of the people receiving unemployment insurance benefits. So 95% is almost everyone, right? So we could have good confidence that we were looking at good data. However, since the pandemic, so starting in March of 2020, that representation has dropped dramatically. So we've gone down to uh, maybe 50% in some months, maybe 60% in some months, and most recently we've been down around 40%. So we're missing data on a lot of recipients of unemployment insurance. So that tells you that the exact number that we're looking at, the 60% are women or the 73% are, are women, those exact numbers are probably not reliable. Okay, and uh, we will, let me, let me keep going down through the issue brief and, and eventually we'll get to the better data, which looks at jobs in Vermont and is administrative data collected by the Department of Labor directly on every job in the state that pays into the unemployment insurance trust fund. So those, those data will be more reliable. Okay, so let's see. So I mentioned briefly that Vermont looked very different from other states. And one of the big indicators was that Vermont's labor market is not that different from Maine's labor market. So the first state I would look to to see a comparable state might be Maine. And when, um, when Vermont was at 73% women among the unemployed, women in Maine were just 55% of the unemployed in Maine. Okay, so that's a, a pretty big difference. And then that made me think, well, let's go back and look at the data. So it turns out that back in November, we had maybe um, 30,000 people on unemployment insurance. And if you look carefully at the report from the federal government, it says only about 10,000 were in the sample for the unemployed characteristics. Now, in my head back in the day, I thought those 10,000 were the officially unemployed people. And here we have to get into the nitty gritty of what's officially unemployed and what's receiving unemployment insurance benefits. So prior to the pandemic, everyone who received unemployment insurance benefits had to be available and able to take a job if offered, okay? So that's the work search requirement. And that says that if you're able to take a job, if you get offered a job, you are willing to take it. And therefore, prior to the pandemic, you were eligible to get unemployment insurance and you were officially unemployed. Okay, so prior to the pandemic, everybody who got unemployment insurance benefits was counted as officially unemployed. Since the pandemic started in March of 2020, the federal government said, okay, we know that many people are not willing to take a job because of the pandemic, because they have children at home who can't go to school, because they're taking care of elderly parents. For whatever reason, they are not willing to take a job if offered one. So we are not going to hold states to that eligibility requirement. So in Vermont, for example, right now, we have about 20,000 people receiving un regular unemployment insurance, and we have many fewer who are officially counted as unemployed. So when you hear the unemployment rate 
on the news at night, which is now 2.9% or thereabouts, don't believe it <laughs> because that only refers to the people who say that they are willing and able to take a job if offered, okay? So that's a long way of saying that in my head, back in the day, I thought I was looking at officially unemployed people who were answering the survey and saying, you know, 73% of us are women. In fact, that's not right. In, in fact, what happened was that the Department of Labor got pushed on its many, many, many responsibilities. Uh, rightly, they determined that their first responsibility was to make payments to unemployed people who were eligible for those payments and to get the payments out the door to the people who were eligible. So other aspects of their job sort of took a back seat. So this means that they were no longer able to report, to check on responses um, in terms of, of gender. And so what they sent to Washington to, to answer the question, you know, how many of your unemployed are women, how many are men, what they sent was only the, the folks who answered easily, right? So they could easily obtain the data for 10,000 people even though they had 20,000 or 25,000 people who were receiving unemployment insurance benefits, okay? So um, at some point, if you're interested, you may wanna to talk to Matt Barowitz, who is the person at the Department of Labor, who, um, who is in charge of these data and what goes to the federal government. But he will tell you that you know, this was not their first priority, that uh, they simply couldn't keep up with, with everything. And so they were sending fewer data points to the federal government. So as I mentioned, as of March, 2021, the sample was only about 40% of the total number of people getting unemployment insurance benefits in Vermont. Maybe I should pause there and see if there are any questions so far. I do wanna remind people that I'm talking only about regular unemployment insurance. So I'm not talking about the folks who are getting PUA, the pandemic unemployment assistance that goes to the self-employed and sole proprietors and so forth. Uh, there is no um, established system for looking at those characteristics. So this is only for regular unemployment insurance. And Joyce, I don't see Uncharacteristically, I don't see any <laughs> Okay, we'll keep going. So now I want to assure you that we do have very strong evidence that says that women are still disproportionately affected by the pandemic. I should say working women. Those who were working are def definitely disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And for this, I'm going to rely on what's called the earnings and jobs by gender report that's put out by the Vermont Department of Labor. So we have data, very strong data on every job in Vermont that pays into the UI system showing how many are women, how many are men. This is by job, not by person. So if a person has two jobs, they would be counted twice but it is very strong data. And um, we can look at both quarterly jobs held by men and women and also at quarterly wages. So we're going to look at the change in the number of jobs held by men and women from, um, from the, uh, let's see, what do I focus on here? From the second quarter of 1919, I, I'm sorry, 2019, second quarter of 2019 to the, to the second quarter of 2020. Okay, so we're talking what, April, May, June, 2020 compared to April, May, June, 20, 2019. So uh, if you're looking at the issue brief, you will see that the decline in the, in the number of women who held jobs was about 17.5% over that one year period. And at the same time, the number of jobs held by men in Vermont was about 15%. Okay, so a much a, a steeper decline in the percentage fall for women. Uh, moreover, if you look at the number of jobs that declined, it went down by about 30,700 for women and about 25,000 for men. So you can see more jobs 
previously held by women no longer existed um, in the second quarter of 2020. And you could do the same comparison using the third quarter of 2019 and 2020, and you would see a similar drop. It was 12.5% for women and just 9.7% for men. So again, we're seeing a disproportionate hit to jobs held by women in Vermont. Okay, questions about that? Okay, good. And now we're going on and I'm going to add one more little wrinkle, which will try to say that we have good evidence also showing that it's mostly low income women who were hit by the pandemic. Um, if you look at the data on uh, wages, and if you see an increase in the average wage between 2019 and 2020, it's suggesting that the folks with low wage jobs dropped out of the labor force. In other words, their jobs were no longer in existence, okay? So think of all the, all the wages for all the jobs in the economy. And if you chop off the lower end, then the average wage is going to increase. So that's what happened between the second quarter of 2020 and the second quarter of 2019. So you can see there's a little table there showing that second quarter of 19 to 20, the um, average wage for women increased about 13.3%. The average wage for jobs held by men increased by 8.9%. So it's about 13% versus 9%. So quite a difference in that average wage. The same pattern exists in the third quarter of 2019 versus 2020, 13.1% uh, drop, I'm sorry, increase in the average wage for women and an 8.8% increase in the average wage for men. So again, this is just saying that more women with low wage jobs seem to have lost their jobs and are no longer part of the workforce in Vermont. Okay, good. So that's the end of the fiscal note. Uh, I'm sorry, the issue brief. I'm getting my my publications mixed up. Um, um, Joyce, Joyce, I'm sure. sorry. This is I do, I do have a, a a question. I'm just trying to understand your table too. Sure. Um, right. When you say so, dollars three hundred and sixty one. What That's does that the mean? Difference. Okay, so difference. so think the difference, right? So think of the average wage for women. This is per quarter. So let's okay. say it's five thousand dollars. That's not correct, but let's say it's five thousand dollars in uh, twenty nineteen. Then in twenty twenty, when we looked at the average wage, it would be higher at five thousand three hundred and sixty one dollars. Okay. okay, the mm -hmm. average wage has gone up, meaning that. In this case, we can be pretty certain that more low-income women have lost jobs. And then of course, the difference gets much bigger as you go to the second and third quarters, it's up around $1,000. So you're going from maybe $5,000 per quarter up to $6,100 per quarter as the average wage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there All right. questions? Let me before you move. Are there questions sure. on the um, issue brief? Um, uh, Representative Whitman and then Representative Whitman, um, Redmond. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Joyce, for being here. Um, with your figure two about the increase in wages, I completely understand um, how uh, lower income. Uh, people leaving the workforce would result in an increase in the average uh, wage. But I just have to ask, um, were there other things that you considered that could have also led to some kind of incidental increase in wage? I mean, it's during the pandemic, so hard to imagine. Um, but, you know, employers may be paying more for people that Absolutely. pay anything like that. Were there considerations there? Absolutely. And uh, so, so I guess the obvious thing is that uh, we know that 
some employers have found it difficult to find workers for open slots and they may be offering higher wages, absolutely. The, the other possibility is that folks at the high end of the wage scale may be doing very well in some circumstances and, and may be earning higher wages. So it's certainly possible that that's going on as well. However, um, I'm going to be showing you some information about where the job loss happened by industry. And we're going to see that it's, it's very strongly in the uh, hospitality uh, services sector. And that's where many women are in relatively low wage jobs. So we have substantiating evidence on our side. Thank you. Sure. Representative Redman and then Representative Rumstead. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so I have a question about um, the people who drop off and stop looking for work. And we, we don't really know. I mean, do we, do we have any other way to account for that or to know what universe of people we're talking about? Um, and I'm wondering going forward, because this is always problematic. We talk about this low unemployment rate and yet there are all these people who are just like they've given up or whatever, they have extenuating circumstances. But I'm wondering if there is any other way we can kind of determine that or capture that or something we should be doing in the future to be able to really reflect accurately what the unemployment rate is. Yes, thank you. That raises a very good, good point. And I should have mentioned that starting next week, I believe, the Department of Labor is requiring people once again to be looking for work and to answer, yes, I'm able and willing to work if offered a job. So this is going to be a giant experiment in the state of Vermont. Um, I'm guessing that the unemployment rate uh, is going to rise because more people will be answering yes to that question and therefore they will be officially counted as, as unemployed. It will also be interesting to see if more people actually take jobs and therefore don't take unemployment insurance because officially, if, a, if an employer offers, offers a person a job, if they're unemployed and getting unemployment insurance and they refuse the job, then the employer is supposed to report that person to the Department of Labor. So um, we will see what happens. I, I do think the official unemployment rate will rise in the coming months. And uh, it, it's gonna be really interesting to see. And then just one other thing, there'll always be that universe of people though, who, who have just stopped looking and are not really, there's no way to know that they're, you know, they're either underemployed or whatever, and they just, they're not recorded anywhere, I'm guessing. Well, that will always remain. Yes, so there are people who are considered to be discouraged workers, that's the official term. So they have stopped looking for work because they think there's not a job out there for them. They wouldn't take a job even if it were offered to them and so forth. So um, there have been a number of articles, New York Times and elsewhere about people who are reconsidering their lives and what it means to you know, be on the rat race and, and be working too many hours a week and not seeing their families enough and so forth. And maybe the pandemic has has caused some of them to rethink what's most important to them. So it's going to be interesting again to see what happens, particularly with women who have been coming into the labor force at greater rates, um, to see if there's a real shift in, in how many of those women come back or how many decide to not come back. Um, or how many decide to come back on their own terms so that maybe they're taking part-time jobs or uh, more flexible jobs or whatever. Yeah, this is going to be a big experiment. So um, I have a question about that same chart that our chair had a question about um, chart or table two. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, I, I'm obviously not reading this right. So I need help, but... Um, so the female is $361, but the male $249. Doesn't that mean then the opposite of what we're saying, which is that women are getting less than men? This looks like they're getting more. Than okay, men. good question, good question. All right, so I'm now staring at both the table and the chart. 
And we can say that the average wage in 2019 for women, let's make it easy. Let's say it's $8,000, okay? Okay. So I'm looking at the red line for women. And in the second quarter of 2019, we're gonna call it $8,000, okay? Now we're moving to the second quarter of 2020. And we can see that the average wage for women is up a bunch and it's up by about $361 according to the table, okay? So that's the average wage for women, meaning that the women who are still in jobs, still working at jobs, are getting a higher average wage in 2020 than the women who were working back in 2019. Okay, so there are fewer of them working, but they're getting a higher average wage okay. over the three months of the quarter. So that tells, that suggests strongly that it's the low wage workers who have lost their jobs on average, okay? Okay, so, so men are getting less of an increase than the women, right. are those that are left in the job market. So they, that would suggest that some of the lower paid workers are still in the market. Is that what you Yes, maybe a greater percentage of the lower wage workers among men are still in their jobs. So a smaller percentage of the lower wage workers have lost their jobs for men, right? Okay, okay, it's interesting. Yeah, you have to get your mind around it a bit. <laughs> uh, Joyce, we have one other question or one other person asking questions. I'm sorry, um, Jessica, Representative Rumstead, are, did you have other questions? No, I'm done. I just, it's hard to manage all the different things opened on oh. the screen <laughs> to get the others. Um, Representative Noyes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wonder, do we collect the data of the number of people who are on unemployment that have dependents, both male and female? So um, the answer is that during normal times, pre-pandemic, the Department of Labor tells us that 45% of unemployment insurance recipients have dependents. So somehow, I, I don't know exactly how they know, but they know that about 45% have dependents. We think that because more low wage people are unemployed during the pandemic, that that percentage has risen to maybe 50 or maybe even 55%. Low wage workers tend to have more children than high wage workers. But it's not a question asked to collect unemployment. On, on so- that data. So somehow they know, so they must be collecting the data in some way. I will add to this that the mainframe at the Department of Labor that does the unemployment insurance uh, calculations is unable to differentiate between eligible people with dependents and those people who do not have dependents. So as the mainframe stands now, they would be unable to implement a dependent benefit. They could offer a, an extra benefit like the supplemental $600 a week to everybody because that's one payment amount that goes to everybody on unemployment insurance. But they do not have the capability and they don't have any coders who are capable of um, differentiating between who has a dependent, who does not, who gets the $50 a week dependent benefit, who, who does not. So that is the problem. Thank you. Sure. I think that's it for the questions thus far. Um, and Representative Noyes, to follow up though on your question, that was something that we asked um, the Deputy Commissioner of um, Economic Services. Um, we we're trying to figure out um, actually not who have dependents, but who has dependents who um, might be accessing some kind of assistance from the Department of Economic Services. And they seem to have some kind of data match. We'll see, we're in, we're in theory getting some kind of information for them from them, at least in terms of what um, 
individuals with low income are receiving in terms of assistance now and with the extra with the pandemic. That's coming today. Thanks, Joyce. So are we on to the next? So yes, I put together some slides so that we can also look at the industry shares of people who are unemployed. So that might be interesting for people as well. And again, those slides are available on the um, committee website if, if everybody wants to tune into those. So the question is, what do we know about who is unemployed in Vermont? And unfortunately, because we don't have a lot of confidence in that data set called characteristics of the unemployment insurance recipients, um, we're not going to have as much data as we wish to answer the question, but we can uh, once again look at the jobs that were lost and the jobs that were lost correspond in many cases to people who are now unemployed. So we'll, we'll get there through a back door. Okay, so, so once again, I'm just reinforcing the fact that the characteristics of unemployment insurance recipients covered about 10,000 Vermonters back in, back in November, but 21,000 at that time were getting unemployment insurance payments. So even back in November, we, we covered about 50% of the people getting unemployment insurance. So again, that sample was not representative. So I had this very nice picture that showed you male and female shares in Vermont relative to the country as a whole. And lo and behold, there was this big difference, which looks very impressive. Um, I also looked at the shares by age group. And once again, we had a big difference or a sizable difference in older workers in particular with Vermont having more older workers on unemployment insurance. Unfortunately, the Vermont numbers here may not be entirely accurate. So then uh, we also had this wonderful spaghetti line chart. I'm now looking at what's called figure one, regular unemployment insurance recipients in Vermont and the US. So the red and blue lines, the solid lines were um, Vermont, the dashed lines were the US. And you can see that the swings over the year were much more pronounced in Vermont than in the US. So the US share of, of women on unemployment insurance was varying between maybe 52% and maybe 37%, okay? Whereas in Vermont, the share was varying pre-pandemic from about what, 25% to about 57%, okay? So much, much bigger swings. Now that pattern seemed pretty regular in 2018 and 2019 until the pandemic hit. And then you can see things just went backwards, upside down, kerfluey. So that starting in um, April of 2020, women, the solid red line in Vermont, all of a sudden jumped way up, uh, went up to 60% and then kept going up to the 73, 74% in October of 2020, you can see that. Uh, at the same time, the women's share for the US, which is the dashed line, the women's share did show a different pattern. So all of a sudden women's share was bigger than men's in the US as a whole, but the difference was what, 53% maybe for women versus 47% for men. So not at all as, as stark a difference. So again, I've got that arrow and red letters saying based on a small sample to say, the general idea is probably right for Vermont, but the exact numbers are probably not. Okay, and finally, the, my original issue brief had this nice table, which showed by different sectors, by different industries in Vermont, where are we seeing the unemployed? And we were finding 26% of the unemployed came from the accommodation and food services sector, about 12.5% from the healthcare and social assistance sector, about 5% from educational services. Again, those shares were quite a bit higher than the national average. Okay, again, probably in the right direction, probably not the exact right numbers. So now lo let's look at some really good data 
Uh, these are Vermont labor force estimates seasonally adjusted. So I can look at the civilian labor force and the number of people who are employed. And you can see in March, 2021, the most recent data we had, we have about 304,000 people who are employed. And actually I should be saying jobs because this comes from jobs data collected from employers. So the employer says, yes, Susie Q is employed at my firm. And maybe the employer down the road says, yes, Susie Q, the same Susie Q is employed at my firm. So these are actually counting jobs, not people. Okay. So Joyce, when you say these are count, these are jobs. Yes. I'm self-employed. So am I counted in that or no? So I'm not counted in that. No, because you don't pay into the unemployment insurance system. Okay. So, right. Okay. So you can see the change from March, 2020 to March, 2021. There's a column called change from way over on the right-hand side. And you can see that we've lost about 29,500 jobs between March of last year and March of this year, okay? So that's, that's the change in the number of jobs in Vermont. All right, so that's good data. And now just to show you how bleak things have been, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of a longer perspective. So here's a chart from the um, US Bureau of Labor Statistics. So this is data for Vermont. And you can see back in 2011, January of 2011, when the chart starts, that we had about, what, 338,000 jobs. Uh, we were tootling along just fine, doing well, uh, a little bit of a decrease because of our demographic structure in Vermont. We have fewer working people as the years go by, more older people. But then in, what, April of 2020, we see this big plunge which dropped all the way down to about 303,000. And since then has bumped up a little bit, but certainly nowhere near back up to the normal level. Okay. So once again, those are good data and we can see that change in employment or the number of jobs over time. Moving on to the next chart. Now here I have the, the good earnings and jobs data by gender from the Department of Labor. And I can see by sector where the job loss has occurred. So if I had all of the sectors here, all of my percentages would add up to 100%, okay? So I'm asking from which sector do the um, job losses come? So scanning down the, the percentages here on the right-hand side, I can see almost 42% of the job loss came from the accommodation and food services sector. So when you hear that bed and breakfasts and inns and restaurants and uh, catering and so forth are having trouble, uh, yes, that's absolutely true. 42% of the job losses are coming from that sector. Now I should say the most recent data we have are from the third quarter of 2020. So that's July, August, September, 2020. Uh, in another couple of months, we'll have the fourth quarter of 2020. So this is a bit backwards looking, unfortunately. You can see the other sector with big job losses was educational services, 10.7% of, of job loss came from that sector, but also a sizable loss in retail trade, in healthcare and social assistance and arts, entertainment and recreation. What's remarkable about all of those sections, all of those sectors, notice that I haven't talked about manufacturing yet, but all the other sectors have very large percentages of women who are employed in those sectors, okay? So you can understand why it is that women are disproportionately hurting from the pandemic. Now in manufacturing, we did see 5% of job losses coming from that sector. Those do tend to be more male dominated jobs. So that would be the one sector that's not uh, female dominated. Good. 
Okay, and here I, I'm still I'm still sort of reeling with it's close to thirty thousand jobs we lost. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people who who count as unemployed. So yes, so you're you're not counting the um, the, the sole proprietors, and you're not just counting the discouraged workers. So these are jobs, right? These are jobs. Uh, about thirty thousand were lost. And uh, back in the fall, we did have 30,000 people receiving unemployment insurance benefits. So there is a bit of a, a correlation there, a connection between jobs lost and people receiving benefits. It's not one for one, there's some uh, wiggle room in both the jobs and the people, but it sort of matches up. Now, because I asked a question, we now have lots of questions. Um, <laughs> Representative Brumstead and Representative Rosenquist. Right. I broke the silence. Yeah, I did raise my hand right when you spoke, but <laughs> um, one thing about this that I just wanna make sure I'm thinking about it straight is that the jobs, you say we lost the jobs, but it's not a typical depression or you know recession it's because we asked those jobs to close because we didn't want people getting covid and so there's i would think a better than half chance that a lot of these jobs will come back for example the education jobs we know will have to come back and the healthcare jobs are really just the people who weren't working with covid patients um, a lot of them, you know, there wasn't people going in for dermatology visits or for um, the th types of things that are, um, they were nervous about going in for, right? If they weren't an emergency, they weren't cancer, or they weren't something that they really had to deal with, but they'll, they're all going to come back. And my, the reason I bring this up is that that's where we are now. And to me, the thing we hear more now is the flip of this, which is we don't have the employees coming back, right, into the market. So those jobs all went away. They all changed maybe their lifestyle in one way or another. And now those jobs are coming back and we have employers saying we can't, especially in the restaurant industry where people are saying we just can't pay them enough to come back. And so, I, I don't really know what my question is, but I just think that's important to note that we didn't lose the jobs forever. We lost some of them and it would be curious to know down the road how many we really lost that will never come back, um, I guess. And it, it's a little bit sad. I know someone who lost a restaurant but the new person who bought the restaurant just a month ago is you know, totally, um, to the wall on it you know they're like crazy busy now and they didn't have the mortgage to pay all those months we we as a society didn't lose the restaurant but the person who happened to own it during the pandemic lost his livelihood so it's it's just an interesting it's such a different experience than we've ever studied before it seems like absolutely um you make a very good point i i would just add that we can't be sure that that all the jobs will come back. And I, I know you didn't mean to imply that, but it is interesting to think that some manufacturers are moving more to robots. Um, some uh, ways of delivering services may be changed. You know, we, we, we may decide to uh, change the way that we do business in, in many types of industries. Um, so it, there is going to be a time of transition where there's a mis mismatch between the people who want to work and the characteristics of the jobs that are looking for a worker. Um, so again, it's, it's going to be an interesting transition period and uh, uh, there are likely to be lots of bumps along the way. Thank you. Representative Rosenquist, your question. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, we were saying that women looked like they were disproportionately affected by the pandemic in terms of losing employment, but are there any statistics that show that were they disadvantaged economically worse than men? Uh, because of course, in many cases, they were getting 
regular unemployment plus either six or $300 of federal unemployment on top of that. And I was just curious, does that play into the fact of the, uh, the fact that these people were more adversely affected or not, or, they're, or they don't have to go back into the workforce at this point? Uh, it, is there any, any way we'd know that or not? Right, so this gets into a whole nother line of inquiry. Um, I read one statistic saying that 42% of people who are receiving unemployment insurance are actually financially better off with the extra federal benefits and so forth than they were when they were working. So that says that they were low wage workers they got their unemployment insurance, which is usually 57% of their average wage. Plus they got the $300, they are now getting $300 on top of unemployment insurance and they may be getting subsidized health insurance. So financially on paper, they may be better off. Now, what you're missing is Yes, but they don't have the connection to work. They're not earning benefits. They're not uh, earning time off. Uh, they don't. They don't have that that uh, feeling of of you know being important on the job and so forth. So uh, there are many many factors to consider. But but yes, you are right that some people are financially better off, and that may be a reason why they are reluctant to go back to the workforce. Yeah, that's the point I was trying to make. Thank you. Sure. Okay, okay so let's yeah, you go ahead and I want to warn you and the committee, you only have 10 minutes before you need to be at your next meeting. So yes. Thank you. I'm I'm watching the clock here. I just have a few more slides. Okay. Okay. So um, we just looked at uh, overall job losses by sector. And here next is a chart showing job losses in Vermont by both sector and gender. And you can see that those sectors that have the taller bars all have taller bars for women, the, the rose colored bars, except for manufacturing. Manufacturing has a taller bar for losses by men. So again, this is just to reinforce that the big job losses happened in the sectors where women we're holding more jobs and lost more jobs. Okay, um, and here I wanted to talk a little bit more about evidence from other states in terms of um, the women's share. And so we've already talked about the fact that um, Maine might have a similar labor force to Vermont. Maine was around 55% women on UI benefits when Vermont was at 73%. Um, this was the chart that I used back in the day to show that the Vermont green uh, line for women, the dashed line at the top, was rising much more rapidly than the, uh, what color is that, orange line for Maine. Um, again, that may have been overstated. We won't know for sure. But I did want to reinforce the idea that Vermont has more women participating in the labor force than Maine. So if that's true, we might expect more job losses among women in Vermont than Maine, simply because there are more people, more women working in Vermont than in Maine. However, uh, it, it was surprising to me at the time, it's still a little bit surprising to me, that women's labor force participation is not that much different in Vermont than in Massachusetts or New Hampshire. So I was surprised. I had thought that we had a much higher um, rate of labor force participation for women than those states, but in fact, we're, we're about at the same level. And then finally, my last slide looks at people 55 and over. And again, we can see that Vermont has a higher, older women's labor force participation rate than Maine. But again, we're actually a tiny bit lower than the labor force participation rate for women in uh, both New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So that was interesting to me and I thought might be interesting to you as well. 
So that concludes my slides and thank you all for your attention. Um, if there are further questions, I'm happy to answer. Let me um, ask. Representative Wood. Thank you. Um, Joyce, just a, a quick question on the last slide. I noticed that there's no US data for men and women broken out, just the total. Is that is not available by gender or? So I recall at the time I was putting these together back in January, I was unable to find the US share. I think since then I did stumble across the US shares and I should update this slide because um, that would be an interesting interesting comparison. So I will try to do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Joyce, thank you. Thanks for um, stopping in to House Human <laughs> Services. Um, appreciate that. And we look forward to seeing you more. And thanks for the information as we sort of try to figure out who are the unemployed so we can figure out what, if anything, in addition, we can do to help them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for your flexibility on the timing. Appreciate no problem. Um, so um, committee, uh, we had asked for um, some, a chart, right, if you recall on Friday, um, in terms of continuing our sort of diving into um, either who are the unemployed and what, are, what type of, of assistance and, or, and help um, does the state of Vermont giving to families, individuals and families during this time? And uh, the Deputy Commissioner of Economic Services, um, uh, uh, Trish Tayo, had sort of given us this whole, this laundry list, and we all sort of looked a little cross-eyed and said, can you put it together in a list? And um, uh, in, in, in true government fashion, um, the list has to go through the commissioner's office and we don't have it yet. Um, so as soon as we um, have it, um, we can um, go over it and see what it tells us um, and those kinds of things. Um, I know that at least um, Mary Beth, if not, and I uh, looked at um, and um, looked at the hearing on UI. Um, and I looked at some of the written testimony, written letters that people sent in. I don't know if anybody else did. Um, Mary Beth, what was your takeaway from, from, from that? Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I watched it. It was about an hour and a half. It was scheduled for two hours, but I guess a number of people didn't um, show up for their time slot. Um, but it was, it was, you know, I guess what I expected, my, um, I anticipated that I would hear kind of different trends, trends of issues, but what I was surprised by was the range of issues. Um, it was quite diverse. Um, everything from um, just getting through on the phone to um, still being in an appeals and, at, you know, adjudication process, um, you know, uh, getting reps on the phone who, you know, are not Department of Labor employees and the challenges of that, like it was really the wide gamut of issues. And the people I was hoping the whole time I was listening that the Department of Labor was literally listening and taking down each name because <laughs> each person had a very challenging situation that clearly had not been rectified, all of the people who spoke. Um, and th there were a couple of employers who were concerned about um, the point Carl brought up earlier, um, but that was, you know, were only a couple who were concerned, but really focus, focused on um, workforce, you know, workforce, like hiring people. That was their yeah. concern. But yeah, it, overall, it was, I mean, it really, really was like a wake up call relative to our mainframe system huh. and all of that like we really need to replace that for yeah. sure i mean that was that was my impression too but in thinking about what is our focus you know we, we get to pass on the fact that they were having issues with the department of labor to another committee but if i'm looking at so what was the theme 
the theme is they need cash. They need money. I mean, that's what people, they, um, to be correct, they need financial assistance. They need the, um, what they were, the reason they were talking was because they needed the dollars that the unemployment ins um, insurance was was doing that. And there's even, there's I guess there's a question out there um, whether or not um, they'll be able to access or, or receive the, the, um, the, the checks that they did not receive because of the delays or because of the, um, the issues with the name, the mainframe. And so what I, I was sort of, I guess, naively hoping in listening to some of this that, that there would be identification of, of what they needed the money for or did they need something else but really I mean it's like what what the unemployed um, Vermonters seem to need is um, financial assistance to pay their bills um, that's what I got out of everything I don't know if anyone else besides Mary Beth and I had nothing better to do this weekend than read that um, if anyone else looked at that um, kinds of stuff. Um, I looked at some of the letters um, and actually looked, cause I had done the unemployment thing, you know, way back last summer. And so I went back and I have a whole folder on it and I was looking up some childcare stuff and there it was unemployment. And I thought I should look at this for next week. <laughs> um, and it seemed, I agree about the IT stuff. That was their biggest thing is not talking to humans that had any idea where, you know, they felt like they didn't even know where Vermont was, which seemed odd to me because I don't think we had people from India helping. So, but um, I, I hate to say there's some people in, in the United States who think that Vermont is a city. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But, um, but the other thing was that, um, was that time that they didn't have their unemployment all figured out. And they so they were living with no money at all and had maybe three little kids. And, and actually it was the parent child centers that over and over again in my letters that I re, you know, read again had saved them because they went in and said, I'm not hearing from unemployment, nobody's helping me. And parent child center had that extra money that we had allocated to them last summer and they were using that money to help some of these folks out and so I agree that it's the money in the end they just needed to be able to pay their bills to get them to a point where they were connected into the unemployment system and then they did much better and the most letters seemed to come from the people with children it seemed like those were the ones who were really feeling the pain of not having enough um, to take care of everyone at home. Um, so I, I also, that makes me think about the Parent Child Center and their, what they're hoping for as well, um, to be able to have that fund that they can use to help families that are really in crisis. Um, and the other thing I would add is um, overwhelmingly the number of women who testified Definitely, that reflects the numbers that we saw today. And the other thing is what we've read, you know, on the national level about child care. And I, I heard you heard from, you know, a number of witnesses with children who were like, you know, my employer wants me to get back. I'm trying to work from home. I don't. I lost my child care. You know, it doesn't make sense for me. Like just this unbelievable, like pulled in different directions and trying to balance this whole thing. Um, so that that I definitely heard, you know, like so hopefully let's keep our fingers crossed that what we um, passed in terms of um, H-171 and the money in there will help with that. Yep. Absolutely. You know. Um, so we're really, so, um, you know, I want us to wait, you know, um, we're really, we're sort of on a fact finding mission and we're missing some, um, information. And when we get that, we'll see what that is and see if there's a silver bullet or, um, not in terms of anything else that we can do. Um, we are in the last fingers crossed, the last two weeks 
of the legislative session. Um, and uh, congratulations committee. We were, um, uh, Dane did a, knocked it out of the park in Senate um, Health and Welfare. Dane, do you wanna say what happened this morning? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, 9 a.m. this morning, we had a chat, um, did a quick walkthrough of uh, our amendment, uh, answered a few questions. David Englander from the Department of Health was there and um, they passed it out of committee 5-0 with approval and it just got voted out of the Senate today. Um, so it is, it is through. It is on its way to the governor's office. Um, and um, I will pass on to you. I have gotten um, a copy of uh, two um, national articles that, that got generated. Um, uh, and I don't know, actually, I, I, I won't have to. Did, did you all get them? I got one. Okay, well, I will, I will pass them to everybody. I'll make sure that everybody um, you know, has those two. Um, Senator Lyons is, is quoted in one and the other um, I think is, is just um, saying what we did collectively, um, what we did so that that is um, good. Um, and um, Jessica, you did a fabulous job of reporting um, H-171 on the um, house floor and uh, that little hiccup um, got um, got through, and uh, I happened to be listening to the Senate. Um, actually, Dane, I think you were still in the committee room, but they they decided to talk about it. Um, and actually, I think had Katie go through it at the end of their meeting this morning, um, and and Ginny informed them that um, it, it was fine, and that, um, <laughs> that 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 it had been all worked out, and that so. Um, when that happened, when that gets over to the Senate, I think that it um, that it should be um, smooth sailing. The, the snafu in terms of language and all of that. Um, um, actually, I, I didn't see the email um, until after, um, but we had gotten the um, we got uh, sort of the check okay from. Um, the Senate Chair of Appropriations, um, Senator Kitchell, and from the House Chair of Appropriations, um, uh, Representative Hooper. Um, and so, um, as well as joint fiscal, which seemed to be an important um, third party on, you know, on this. So um, it should be smooth sailing. Um, and uh, tomorrow morning, um, uh, we're going to, um, in terms of our committee meeting, we'll, um, one, we're going to get, shall I say, an issues update from the Department of Children and Families. I'm calling an issues update, like uh, on their ongoing projects, not necessarily a problems update, but rather they have three sort of ongoing things that we might be interested in or we are. One is um, their progress to date on the um, uh, Beckett, I forget what it's now called, the um, replacement of um, a locked facility for justice involved youth. Um, Representative Wood, you, your hand went up before I started talking, so go ahead. No. It's I, I'll, wait you, I'll wait you're done, Madam Chair. Okay, it's thank you. covered bridges. Thank you. Okay, update on covered bridges. Thank you, I'll remember. Um, an update or a, um, sort of what is this all about? Many of us read this um, interesting article in Vermont Digger about the uh, plan of the department to um, uh, bring into play um, specialized foster homes or professional foster homes to deal, to perhaps bring um, the over 100 youth children and youth who are in out-of-state placements. Um, and uh, this was interesting and important to, um, to hear about. And um, I thought perhaps we could understand what this was about. Was this addressing um, what kind of children, you know, what children are we talking about? And 
Um, does that mean that we can um, remove from the budget the language that we have in the budget that references that they'll come back with um, um, sort of an assessment of what is the payment rate for foster care workers? So, um, okay, I have a question. This is my favorite. How many of you have pets? Have you ever boarded your pet? Okay, Jessica, you don't have your things on. How much does it cost a night to board your pet? I think we have two. So we pay like $60, I think, or 40. Okay. It's between 40 to 30. Oh, what are you going to do? Charge your, your friend there to take care of the dog? No, no, no. I didn't charge oh, anything. Exactly. This was, no, um, Topper, this was, I want to make sure that my statement still held, which is um, it costs more to board your pet than what the state um, pays as a stipend to foster care um, uh, parents, um, which um, at the low end is $19 and maybe at the high end is 30, something like that. Um, so we, you know, anyway, um, so that's the second one. And the third one is there is that large federal law that passed a couple of years ago. Um, Family First Prevention Act, which requires the state to have a, um, um, a plan by October as to how they were going to meet the various um, components of it. And perhaps these um, professional foster homes is their way of doing that. But so those are the three updates that we're going to have um, tomorrow. I'll stop there because Teresa's hand is still up. Um, I was just uh, checking out the agenda, Madam Chair, and there are a few things that Appropriations is waiting for us to get back to them on. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Representative Whitman has a report on one. I have a report on one, and I don't know if anybody else does. And if we could get the sort of the committees okay, then we can give them some feedback, yeah. some official feedback. <laughs> well, I am, I am, I am hoping um, that we can do some of that right now, oh, if okay. that works, um, because it, it's not even four o'clock, um, and. Uh, and um, so before we do that, I'm like quite excited. So um, Jessica, I'm not sure how, when they're going to do, you know, um, I'm not sure if, if, you know, when formally that they will act on um, 171 um, or whether since they took it up, that's enough as to whether or not you'll need to go in there or not. Um, Check in. Also, yeah, um, but also I wanted my, you know, this was a big day for us. We had two things on the um, calendar. Um, Taylor, this was your, your I mean, not your first time talking on the floor. You seem to talk on the floor a lot. No, <laughs> but it was your first bill report and um, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. A, a very I, uh... good do enjoy talking on the floor for sure. <laughs> no. Well, you do it well, um, you know. Um, and uh, so um, that seemed to go smoothly. And um, because it's treated as a bill that will be up again um, tomorrow. Um, and uh, so, and that sort of will be our, so, you know, as a whole, our committee had a bang up day around three of our <laughs> um, issues. So that's pretty exciting, um, wonderful. Um, so yes, new subject um, focused on what um, Teresa was talking about. And I, I reference, this is the budget in terms of what's in the budget, um, which um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how much of a change will happen, um, but if we go on um, the uh, joint fiscal web page now, there is a new update or a new set of directions from the federal government about use of ARPA funds that may, may impact 
affect some things. Um, I, however, given what we have right now, um, the small piece was sort of a, um, what, what um, I was referencing that's in um, Dan and James's ballpark, which was the language around foster care. And they're like, can we just pull that out now? And I'm like, can we like find out how real this proposal is and what this is before we um, do that? Um, so uh, uh, Teresa and Dane, why don't you um, move to your stuff? Dane, why don't you go ahead about the substance use? Sounds good. Um, thanks, Teresa. Um, so just an update um, from appropriations and we've reviewed this in the past, but I just wanted to follow up to make sure. Um, in our original recommendation, you might recall that we talked about the um, kind of wage gap between um, master's level clinicians uh, working for designated agencies and specialized service agencies. Um, and we proposed um, some funds to sort of bridge that gap, at least part way. Um, since then, um, we've sort of uh, shifted gears within appropriation to identify that there was already this large fund um, that was designated towards workforce development. Um, and um, it was a $5 million fund to begin with. And the thinking was, let's just use this money. Um, since over the weekend, I followed up um, to confirm how much money is left in that fund. Um, right now it's 1.5 million, um, and uh, which is still, um, you know, it's comparable with what we asked for as far as bridging, bridging the gap. I think we had about 450,000 general fund for the substance use clinicians. Um, so, um, but uh, looked at the language um, that's in the latest draft of the budget, and it's also um, really more targeted towards workforce development as far as um, tuition and loan repayment, kind of like what we had within the child care bill, um, as far as um, really going and uh, addressing those dollars in a more targeted way towards loan repayment, tuition assistance for people seeking continued education um, and was interested in hearing people's thoughts on that. Dane, I got a little lost, sorry. Mm -hmm. Is this just talking about what our committee's recommendation was? Because there was also language, and is that what you were talking about as well? There was also language that, um, I, I, I may not have run by you, but that um, Representative Lippert and I made sure that the, that the old, um, the languishing money, um, that's the 5 million which is what, was to go, not for loan repayment, but to, the purpose was to raise, was to go into the pockets of, um, to go, I mean, to go to direct service workers as cash, as their salary, in, to increase that. So are you saying they don't want to do that and they want to turn that into workforce development money? Within the most recent draft that um, we received from Peter, um, and I can share it with you now. Um, it did seem to be more framed as far as uh, tuition and loan-based repayment. Okay. So, Madam Chair? Yep. So um, that was money that was supposed to have gone out. Three to... years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and... no, I mean, I, um, I was involved in the group with, um, with appropriations three years ago mm -hmm. And we developed this whole plan um, along with Bill Lippert. Um, so the other thing that will impact this is that in the Senate version, 
Uh, they have upped the COLA to home and community-based providers from the 2% that was in the House to 3% um, that has passed the Senate. So um, uh, hopefully that will stick. Um, um, that will uh, be able to impact salaries at uh, the designated and specialized service agencies as well. So I think what Dana is saying is that they haven't changed the original intent of that money. They're just now going to get it out the door. Um, so our specific salary bump request is not, is not there, but by providing a reduction of people's expenses um, through um, you know, tuition payments and loan repayments, then hopefully that will have a positive impact as well. I appreciate that. I'm not willing to have our committee make that um, agreement because that language was negotiated between Representative Lippert and I um, to go into the budget um, very specifically um, for um, not for loan repayment, but for um, increases to alcohol and drug um, providers in community mental health center. Um, and I'm just double checking, Madam Chair. I, uh, we had a um, we had a information from um, Representative Fagan. Mm -hmm. I think that said that he had checked with health committee, but I'm just double checking that. So I'll get back to you on that. Uh, that's um, Dane has just um, forwarded that to me, and um, uh, um, I will get back to um, Representative Lippert. And might I ask the other um, the other groups that when you get written things from your um, person on appropriations, if you could forward it to me as well, because. Um, at this point in time, there are about seven different people who will call and ask for input. Um, and sometimes that they ask me and I'd like to not give in inappropriate information or whatever. Um, but thank you for, um, we'll figure that out. Um, but it sounds like what they're, I mean, would we not like the increase in the COLA? I mean, I hope we're supporting the increase in, in the COLA. Yeah. Oh, good. I, I mean, I am. I don't know. I'm presuming the rest of the committee will support a <laughs> increase in COLA, but yeah. I, I Hopefully you didn't get from anything that we said that we no, were not no, supporting I, that. <laughs> no, no, that is, um, that is fine. Cool. Um, Kelly. Um, if we're talking about budget-related stuff, I... Um, when we hear from DCF tomorrow, I, we would also, I would also, I think the rest of the committee also would like to hear about the um, RFP process for the CIS and um, Family Services Division transportation contract. And I think okay. what we hear, there may be discussion about something in the budget related to that, just, but. Okay waiting um, for some more information. Do we, did, yeah. Um, Julie? Yes. Um, I, oh, no. sorry, um, thanks, Julie. Um, could you um, um, send a follow-up email to um, the crew at DCF that are coming tomorrow and um, ask them that um, hope that one of the people who is coming will be able to speak to the um, RFP that is going out around transportation for CIS. Right. And I'm sorry, excuse me. One of no, them is speaking to the transportation RFP. Is there more than one? No, I don't think so. Okay. The same person who's speaking to Beckett is going to speak to the transportation RFP. Okay, hey, thank you. Good. Just wanted to make sure that was still on the docket for tomorrow and that keep it flagged for something in the budget, but 
We're hoping okay. for a little bit more information first. Thank you. Cool, cool. Um, and Teresa and Topper, have you, ha has the housing, has the homelessness, emergency homelessness plan group gotten together or had any movement? Yes. Uh, I can't remember what day it was now. Yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> um, Teresa, did you send what came back from Kimberly to the chair? I have, I have not because it's not, uh, she was still accepting input from uh, other members of the little committee. So I didn't want to send multiple copies. Okay. But uh, essentially what, uh, what appropriations was looking for was for the group of us. And um, so other members know there were representatives from human services, healthcare, uh, house general and appropriations um, was to um, focus in on supportive services. However, we did broaden our scope because you know us, we wanted to comment on a bunch of things. Um, and it was to provide <laughs> a letter back to the working group that had been working on this emergency housing proposal. And um, they are not going to do that right away. However, um, they're going to wait until after budget negotiations are done, uh, given that things may shift a little in that process. And so um, that, uh, so essentially, you know, there's a draft letter that's going around among these eight members of this uh, little group um, for input right now. Um, and it's, it's kind of just a, really a laundry list of things, additional things we'd like them to consider if they haven't considered um, and uh, suggestions um, because they're gonna to continue to be working on this. Um, so as, as soon as we have something that looks uh, like it's been through the, the full group, then we'll certainly share it back with committee. We're putting our faith in you to solve the issue. <laughs> well, we're not solving the issue. Uh, you know, what it became clear to me was that, um, you know, we were providing particular points of feedback about things we want them to consider that uh, perhaps didn't rise to the top of the proposal list. And um, so that's, that's kind of what the letter does. Um, and uh, a few of us brought up the issues that um, attorney Rad, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but Radbud, Rad, something like that from Legal Aid. Um, had brought up um, specifically around the budget language. That's not going in the letter because that will all be happening sort of outside, but we express some support for a version of, of that language. Um, uh, and um, the issue around food, you know, what happens when sort of like food's been being provided and all of a sudden now it stops. Um, and that, that did not seem like it was frankly addressed at all in the proposal that was was put forth. Um, it just seemed like, okay, now the communities will take care of that. And um, that's- Well, they're gonna work on it. Didn't we hear? Didn't we hear uh, yeah, they were gonna, yeah. they, they were gonna work on it? Yeah, yeah. And there's, uh, so, and there's obviously dates looming um, very quickly when that will happen. So, and then, you know, there was a, again, a bit, quite a bit of discussion around the, Proposal, the Senate's budget does not include money um, for emergency, uh, for permanent housing for homeless individuals. Um, and um, the, the House General Committee members um, were not in favor of that. So they were sending the appropriations members with that kind of feedback during appropriations negotiations. Well, thank you. Thank you for carrying the mantle for us. That's important. Taylor. A uh, quick question in regards to the emergency housing. If I was reading the budget correctly, which I am unsure that I am, um, 
When we were first looking at the budget way back in the beginning, there was a $6.9 million that DCF was looking to move to community agencies around this emergency housing plan. And I believe that that money is still set to move again, if I'm reading this correctly. And I was wondering if you had any more information on that, if they are still planning on moving forward with this transition to community versus keeping it in DCF. Yeah, I asked that question specifically, Taylor, um, because it, it was unclear to me from the presentation that we saw last week about, uh, you know, what was the status of that? And um, the appropriation committee members uh, believe that this is a transition year and that that won't happen to 2023. I'm not sure that the budget fully reflects that yet, but that is what um, the appropriations committee members believe is happening. Okay, thank you. I suppose we can confirm that tomorrow. <laughs> that would be wonderful if you could. I met in our committee when we hear from DCF. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask the commissioner tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you really want me to, I'm happy. Goodbye, I'm just <laughs> um. I, you know, I didn't get that feeling at all that they were going, that they were going to uh, do it. I, the, the agencies that they were going to do it with, aren't ready to do it. I don't think they're going to be ready next year either. I agree with you, Topper. That's why I was worried at seeing it in the budget. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we will, we will see. Well, and um, I, I think that one of the things that was pointed out in this is that essentially, you know, what this plan is doing and, uh, you know, while we have a short-term financing uh, proposal for it, we meaning the global we, um, it's double the number of people being served in the emergency housing program than what was pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a, a big lift in terms of what it is that we would need to look at on an ongoing basis, but um, it's, it's probably a closer reflection to um, the number of people who are homeless in need of assistance than what we were doing prior to the pandemic. A number of families too. Right. Number of families. Yeah. Um, cool. The other two, um, I don't believe that we did we did we make any uh, recommendations that included the parent child centers. Uh I'm not remembering anything specific other than their participation in CIS and childcare. Right, and we didn't because um, we knew that they had that uh, big bill over at the, on the Senate side um, to fix their base. And then the Senate took half of that and put it in one time only dollars. And so that's sort of what happened here. I was actually just looking, and I have it printed somewhere on this desk for the memo that we sent over, but I'm pretty sure that we didn't, that we just sent to our appropriations committee back mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Parent Child Center was in it. Um, and I mean, that, that is an area of um, difference between the House and the Senate. Um, um, as well as uh, an appropriation for the food shelf. Um, so those are sort of two areas that are um, different between the House and the Senate. There's also something in there about um, the donor bank for breast milk for I think 25,000. Does that sound right? I'm not sure, but I, I was surprised to see that it got added in at the last minute, I think. It's again, one time only, so it's not a base project. I asked Kimberly about it and she was going to check it out. I haven't gotten anything written from Kimberly at this point, but she did tell me this morning that she's nervous because of the new rules that have come or new guidance from the feds. And she 
I said, okay, well, <laughs> she said, I think that we're okay, but there might be enough other people not okay that it could impact us. So um, anyhow, we'll learn more as the week goes on, I'm sure. Okay. Um, Jeffrey Pippinger just sent me um, the, um, a couple page document, which um, I'm going to send to all of you and, and Julie can, um, can post. Um, it's a timeline of benefit programs. I, I have to say that right looking at it right now, um, um, I, I need I need some time before I can interpret it. You all might be able to interpret it better than I can. Um, but um, in terms of what are um, what assistance families currently are getting um, and that kind of thing. Um, so um, we will figure we will figure that out. Um, I'm still back to. Um, because I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, um, I think we are, I mean, Mary Beth, you talked about how you, and, and Jessica, about how it's childcare. I mean, that they put some of what they said, but otherwise it's, they needed help accessing um, enough money to pay their bills uh, kind of thing. Um, this is sort of going to be, I guess, yes, Teresa. Um, I, I did just want to, mentioned that um, the $5 million that was in our budget memo of one-time funds for the adult day programs um, was uh, put in the Senate as uh, was retained in the Senate, I should say, because the House had it. Um, and then there is uh, language that the adult day programs are um, supportive of that um, enables this to also be used to um, try to um, uh, reinstate or replace those services that were lost in the three areas of the state, um, as well as to be able to carry those funds over if they're not all used in FY22. That, that language seemed um, to be very supportive of the adult days and the amount was the same and they, they worked with the adult day association on it. So I, I'd recommend that we are supportive of that. Anyone have any problem with Teresa and Dan and Carl saying that, passing that on? Passing the, we support what, the $5 million? Mm -hmm. Didn't we yeah, already, but, yeah, we, we asked already for did that. Well, right. Well, we just, you know, to reinforce and that we oh. also support the, um, the language, the um, additional language. Was that, just, in, was that in our amendment or not? I'm trying to recall. It was this in our letter. Something else. Oh, in a letter. Okay. All right. Okay. Half of it was coming from one-time dollars. This is all coming from one-time dollars. Yeah. Five million is all one-time dollars. Okay. I will pass it on to Representative Yacoboni. Good. Good work. Um, I, of course, am curious. This probably won't be coming that quickly is the $8 million that um, the health department's going to get for um, opioid treatment. There was some, there was, that was in the newspaper, you know, that, that he's gotten an earmark for, for, for Vermont um, and it's going to the health department. I'm curious as to what they're going to do with it um, or when it's going to come. I mean, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, um, before we end for, for this afternoon, is there anything, um, else that we sort of, in this laundry list of what the last couple of weeks, last two weeks are? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this, uh, Thank you.